Welcome to Plymouth University. Welcome to the Reverend Davinsky Building. And welcome to the uh, first Cult Talk of a new academic year. Um, for those of you who are new to Cult Talk, um, this is a series of um, debates uh, hosted by the Cognition Institute at Plymouth University. Um, and we cover um, the whole range of subjects in human cognition, human psychology, behaviour, and neuroscience. And tonight's talk, as you know, uh, tonight's cog talk is entitled uh, Clinical Research, the Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. Now, it's interesting to reflect these days that we all have the opportunity to be our own clinical researchers. I have a friend who hasn't visited the doctor in five years. Whenever he gets any, uh, whenever he comes down with anything, he reckons he can diagnose himself by just looking at his symptoms online. And uh, if he actually needs treatment, he reckons he can get hold of the necessary pharmaceuticals online as well. <laughs> I was going to take a straw poll to find out who else uh, has looked for health advice online. Um, but I think it would be probably more efficient to ask you to raise your hand if you've never looked for advice on a medical problem um, on the internet. Could you raise your hand if you have you've never done that? Okay, so a few people... <laughs> yeah. uh, you, caught, you caught me out there, haven't you? So, <coughs> it's reassuring to know there are lots of other patients of Dr. Google out there. Um, so this raises the obvious question of how to evaluate all that information. In the old days, it was presumably enough for a doctor to put on a bow tie, and that was a sign of absolute trustworthiness. But these days, we've got a flood of advice from bloggers, tweeters, scientists, government agencies, actual medics, how can we sort um, the, the good advice from the bad? Possibly at one end of the scale we've got people who are actually uh, trying to uh, make money by telling a sensational story. So famously, um, the Daily Mail are gradually dividing all substances into the world into those that either cure cancer or cause cancer. Of course, even a Daily Mail journalist has to get his information from uh, his or her information from somewhere. And surprisingly, perhaps, but typically, that information will be original scientific research, research produced by academics, medics, drug companies, etc. And of course, we know that to publish academic research, you have to go through a long process of peer review, being judged by other academics other people in the field who are assessing your research. And for a long time we used to think that this was a sort of gold standard uh, that made, made sure that what was published out there was reliable, could be trusted. But as we know with, um, uh, with the, 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 the replication crisis in academia these days, um, just a, a wave of fraud even in our own area of psychology with people retracting papers where they've essentially made up data, that gold standard has become a bit tarnished. So happily tonight, we have two leading experts in the field um, to guide us through um, this informational minefield. So Dr. Chris Robinson, um, getting his PhD from King's College in London, developing an in vitro model of the blood-brain barrier for modeling um, drug delivery to the central nervous system. He's worked for around 16 years in commercial and non-commercial organisations overseeing and delivering clinical trials research. And he's currently the research governance manager at Plymouth Hospital's NHS Trust. Um, he's an honorary uh, university fellow at Plymouth University and delivers a special study unit on the drug discovery and development process uh, to medical students. He'll be telling us a bit, a bit about that tonight. Andre uh, Tomlin is an information scientist with 20 years experience in evidence-based healthcare. Works in the NHS and at Oxford University, where he helps set up the evidence-based mental, uh, the, the Centre for Evidence-Based Mental Health. In 2002, he spun out his company from Oxford University called Minovation, and he spent the last decade building health websites for charities and the public sector. Most recently, he's been the driving force behind the soon-to-be-launched National Health Service, a series of health blogs designed to help professionals keep up to date with simple, clear, and engaging summaries of evidence-based research. 
So to begin the debate, we'll ask Chris Tomlinson, Chris Rollinson, sorry, um, to enlighten us about research governance and research risk conduct. Thank you very much, Chris. Good evening. Um, I'm the research governance manager for the uh, Derrickwood Hospital, so you're probably not quite sure what a research governance manager does. Um, I'm there to make sure that the research is done to a sufficient quality that uh, it's suitable to be published, also to make sure that any patients who take part in research are not injured or taken advantage of. So that's kind of my main role. Um, so I look at study protocols before they even start, and I, I give my opinion on them. Ultimately, we do go to ethics committees and to the regulatory authorities, depending on what type of study it is. But the important thing to remember is why we do the research in the first place. And for us at Derrickwood Hospital, ultimately what we're trying to do is improve the outcome of our patients. So again, the treatments would not improve unless at some point we did some type of research. Um, and amazingly, patients are surprisingly keen to take part in trials. It, sometimes it depends what type of illness they have, um, and that, that presents special problems to us. So, if we're doing oncology type studies, patients tend to volunteer for all kinds of studies simply because they're grasping at straws. It's very important we let them know that we are doing research and uh, what we're offering them isn't a cure. Um, we hope it might be, but we can't be certain. That's why it's research. So it's important to make sure that people actually do know what they're letting themselves in for. So that's part of my job. That's the good side of research. I'm now going to tell you a little bit about the, the bad and the ugly side. So research governance has been, a, a, and the regulations and rules that uh, govern research has been around for quite some time. And uh, <coughs> unfortunately, quite a lot of it is driven by crisis. There's been a crisis, so they've come up with a new guidance for new regulations. So ho hopefully some of these will be fairly obvious to you. The Nuremberg Code arose directly after the Nuremberg War Trials. There was very little ethical guidance about doing human experiments before that time. In fact, the only country that had any legislation about it was Germany, which was bizarre. So they actually broke their own laws, um, and but not many other countries actually had any legislation at all. The Nuremberg Code came out, and it was supposed to be a guidance document for biomedical scientists about doing experiments on human beings. However, Henry Beecher and Maurice Papworth in the early 60s did a lot of research um, about unethical research and who was doing it transpired that most well-known institutes were still doing unethical research. When they approached the researchers to ask why, and had they not heard about the Nuremberg Code, the stock answer was, Nuremberg Code? Something to do with Nazi war criminals. So there was a disconnect between the Nuremberg Code and the biomedical scientists. They didn't actually realise it was aimed at them. So uh, the World Medical Association brought out this thing called the Declaration of Helsinki. The Declaration of Helsinki is still in force today. It was last updated in 2013. So it changes all the time to keep pace with our changing ethics and views about research. So that's a good step. And it was one of the first things that actually suggested that we should have ethics committees, independent people, looking at research. And early ethics committees were called Helsinki committees. Some of these I'm just going to gloss over. The Medicines Act. That arose partially because of the Glidwide crisis. So that brought out new legislation about how we uh, do design drug studies, particularly looking at the efficacy and the safety aspects of those types of, of studies. Um, one I'll talk a little bit more about, the US National Research and the Belmont Report are US legislation, but they drive, they drive legislation all around the world. The US is the biggest drug market in the world. All drug companies want to market their drugs in the United States. So that's the importance of the United States in setting the agenda for legislation. <coughs> this piece of legislation arose from something called the Tuskegee Syphilis Study that started in 1932 and ran till 1972. It is the longest non-therapeutic study ever done in human beings, all completely unethical. Um, in that particular study, they recruited uh, poor, uh, very poor and very uh, badly educated African sharecrop um, African American sharecroppers, so there were only black African Americans on this study, and then what they were looking at was they were looking at syphilis, and they wanted to see 
I, I, the premise of this study was that black African Americans suffered less neurological deficit than white Caucasian males. Um, and so they started this study, which then ran for years and years. The guys thought that on this study that they were actually getting treatment for a condition that they were told was bad blood. In America, bad blood is a euphemism for anemia, not syphilis. So these guys didn't even know they had syphilis. They were given a, a treatment which later turned out to be an aspirin tablet once a year. They were also given lumbar punctures because they wanted to look at the ingress of syphilis into the central nervous system. They thought that was part of the treatment. That's what they were told. And so this went on for years. They were exempt from the draft in the Second World War because all people who were drafted into the military in the United States were tested for venereal disease and then treated with penicillin. They were the only group that had penicillin in the military in the, in, in the 40s. However, in 53, penicillin was widely available and was known to be useful in treating uh, syphilis. It was decided not to treat them as this was a never again opportunity. And so this study carried on until 1972 until a physician came across the study run by the Public Health Service in America and realized it was completely unethical, tried to stop it, couldn't, leaked it to the press, it was immediately stopped. Bill Clinton appeared on national TV in 1997 to apologize for this study. This is how, you know, how recent this is. Um, the big problem with this study is that ultimately it affects public confidence. It is now virtually impossible to recruit black African Americans onto any medical research projects in the United States. That's the upshot of this study. What they decided was they had a Congress committee and they brought out the National Research Act which said instead of recommending that you should have an ethics committee, it said you will have one. If you don't, you're going to prison. And so they set it in law. They decided that guidance was not working. People were ignoring it. And so that's the beginning of the kind of legislation around uh, clinical trials. Some of these other things, GCP is good clinical practice. It's probably badly named. It should be good clinical research practice. So it's all to do with how we, we carry out our research. So it's a scientific and ethical guideline. And there's several versions of it. But they all have the same thing in common, protecting patients, producing good quality data. And you can see there's other various regulation and guidance that we do tend to follow. If we're in the NHS, for example, we follow this 2005 research governance framework, which sets out broad standards in the, the, what we should consider ethically, how we, we should make sure that the studies are scientifically valid, etc. So that's just a little bit about the research uh, regulation. But basically, all of those rules and regulations have two main themes in common, and it's really simple. Protect the research subjects, produce good quality data. And if we're producing good quality data, then any decision we make about new treatments and new drugs is based on sound data, and we can confidently recommend that to, pa uh, to patients. Where it goes horribly wrong is where we have people like this chap here, Don Poldermans, who manipulates data. This is just one example. Don Poldermans did several large studies looking at uh, giving people beta blockers before cardiac surgery. Beta blockers slow down the heart. And uh, you can see that uh, perhaps if you're doing complex surgery, having a heart that beats slowly might be an advantage. He suggested that if you gave this prophylactically before people went into surgery, it actually improved their outcomes and uh, chances of having successful surgery. Unfortunately, when people looked into the studies, they did a huge meta-analysis where they combined lots of studies. His were a couple of the very biggest studies, but they looked carefully at his data, and unfortunately they discovered that it looked like it had been manipulated. And when they excluded his data from the meta-analyses, the, the combined total, it actually showed a 27% increase in mortality if people had beta blockers before surgery. So completely the opposite. And uh, when some British researchers looked at it, they estimated that would have, you know, if you, we'd given beta blockers before surgery, that would have equated to 10,000 excess deaths within the NHS every year. And if they extrapolated that to Europe, we're looking at 800,000 deaths per year from following that piece of advice. So the moral of that story is if you have bad research and people manipulating data, at the end of the day, patients get hurt. It's not just you know, about their prestige, etc. 
potentially we're talking about genocidal types of injuries to patients if we're not careful. Another example is perhaps where you're probably familiar that drug companies are very good at uh, hiding data and things like that. And the reason this is a, a, a kind of classic story of Siroxat, where um, uh, GSK actually hid the data. And the reason they hid the data is that they wanted to get a marketing authorization in the United Kingdom, and they wanted to include children in the profile, um, because that would improve their sales, etc. So again, they deliberately withheld the data. You may have come and heard of this study because it was a subject of several panorama programs where they uh, found out all the, the problems. GSK escaped prosecution in the UK because our laws were so woolly. Uh, they have since, unfortunately, been tightened up. But in the United States, they're not so woolly. And the FDA, the Federal uh, the Food and Drug Administration in the United States, who look after trials in America, fined uh, GSK three billion US dollars because of this study and the, and the problems it had caused in the United States. You might think that's a pretty hefty fine. But you have to then think to yourself, how much did GSK actually make out of selling Siroxat? It's about 30 billion in estimate. So 10% of their profits, it's almost like a minor tax. So again, when you're dealing with pharmaceutical companies, you do have to remember the huge financial earning power and money they have. And it's not the only example of where they use their financial muscle to get their own way. But having said that, they're not always all bad, and GSK is now at the forefront of trying to make sure that data is widely available. Obviously, they've changed their senior management in, in recent years. Oops. So this is just to remind you what I mean. What is research misconduct? So it represents a significant, a significant departure from accepted practices and importantly has been committed intentionally. What is not misconduct is honest, unintentional error. So we have to be careful about that. Every study I work on or, or I look at at the, at the hospital, there will always be an error on it because we're humans. If there's no errors, the first thing I suspect is fraud. So uh, I like to see a few errors. <laughs> And does, reform, does it matter? Well, unfortunately it does, because it undermines the public trust in research, but also it does make it hard, not just for the public, but for the physicians recommending treatments as well, to understand exactly which treatment is best and which is not. Um, it corrupts the scientific record and obviously leads to false conclusions. Where it also is a big problem is like in the, in the Tuskegee syphilis study, it stops people volunteering for research projects ever again which is an absolute disaster. It's, it's hard enough sometimes to convince people to take part in research studies without having press like this. So it is important that we, we try and take people with us to do studies. Um, this is just to highlight that over the years, in fact, since 1975, there has been a tenfold increase in the retraction rate of scientific papers published in scientific journals. Unfortunately, two thirds of that retraction is due to misconduct, as opposed to people removing those papers because they suddenly thought, oh, actually, my methodology was slightly flawed there. I think, ethically, I better retract that. So these are the kind of forced retractions. So it's, a, it's becoming a problem. The question is, is, was it always there, or have we suddenly got better at recognizing it? So if we look back in history, you only have to go far as, you know, the famous experiments of Gregor Mendel to actually realize that he actually manipulated his data. Because if you try and replicate that experiment, you never get the clean result that he did. So he just tidied up his results, um, but it still fortunately had a truth behind it. So the next question is, how often does this kind of fraudulent behavior happen? And this is a, 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 a kind of another meta-analysis where what normally happens with these types of studies is that a scientific journal asks its readership um, a whole series of questions about fraud and misconduct, and they reply anonymously, because obviously the readership isn't going to say, yes, I've published several fraudulent papers in your journal. So, uh, but the worrying thing is that nearly 2% of scientists actually admitted to some form of fabrication. Uh, that equates to about 40,000 papers per year which are, are perhaps suspect. 
because of, you know, but that does represent quite a large number of papers. Um, and more worryingly, a third of scientists actually admitted to some questionable research practice. Now I can tell you from my experience of looking at research in the trust, where the questionable practices happen is in the analysis of data, um, and particularly looking at statistics. So we've had a big drive on in our trust to try and make sure that we get proper statistical advice for all of our studies and people present the data correctly. And th th that can be quite hard because people are forever keen to, to do their own statistical re you know, analysis, etc. These are some explanations about why fraud happens. Having a good publication record attracts more funding. Limited in infrastructure to support ethical codes and surveillance mechanisms. In our trust, we're doing 500 odd studies at this very moment. There is one person checking the quality of them, and that is me. So that, that shows you the, you know, the potential there. It can, it can be high to, to do things wrong. Character and personal problems. I just stuck this one up for as you, some of your psychologists. Dietrich Staple, uh, charismatic lecturer, later transpired that he'd been making up data for years. So long, in fact, they've actually retracted his PhD as well. So, you know, that, that's the worrying thing. Financial reward. Not so easy now in the UK to run off with research money, but it does happen in the United States. Morrison and Diamond in 1997 ran off with 10 million US dollars in the United States of research money. They were caught by the FBI. They're doing 10 and 15 years. Um, so again, we have cultural differences. Nowadays, we don't just limit ourselves to doing studies just in Plymouth. We do them all over the country, all over the world. So the best studies we do are multinational studies where we look at the huge populations, we do them over very long periods. But again, we do have to be aware that some countries have cultural differences and the data we get may not be as good as we had hoped for. Taught behaviour at school. Again, this is probably where Dietrich Staple probably started. We've all done biology A-level or chemistry A-level where we've done the practical. We know what the outcome of those practicals are. We massaged our, our methodology, etc., and our results to make sure we actually got the right result. And again, once you've done that once and found you could get away with it, it's very easy then to perhaps slip into that habit again. And the other thing is obviously absolute <coughs> education and training. Uh, just to finish up with, this is a good website to visit if you're thinking of getting away with fraud. So it's, uh, it is a very useful site. And this is probably their star pupil. And I just slip this one up because uh, Dr. Fuji is currently, as far as I can tell, the world record holder in fraudulent papers. Um, he's had to retract over 172. And one of the ways he got away with it was by publishing papers that everybody would expect the answer. So it's the type of paper you'd read and think, oh, I expected that. Nobody ever queried it. He also published in journals that his colleagues and other professionals in his area, which is anesthesia, didn't actually read. So, but, you know, the, he was always you know, telling his story to people who didn't know about it. So that's a, a few tips on how to get away with it. But just to remind you, in the UK, we are pretty good at research. We have about 1% of the world's population. But interestingly, we produce about nearly 15% of the world's most cited papers. So those are the papers that uh, people actually then go on to quote and say a, a useful research um, that has been done here. So just to put, you know, say that it's not all bad news. Um, and one of the big things we have at the, uh, up at the hospital is to try and encourage people to get more involved with research, not just uh, researchers coming up with the ideas, but we need to speak to the, the patients as well. There's a disconnect sometimes with what researchers think is important and what patients think are important. And there's a couple of papers here outlining, out, uh, pointing this out. You can see on the top paper where uh, the, the researchers do lots of research on, on drugs, partly driven by the pharmaceutical industry and their need to make money, where the actual patients thought, I can't actually see that one, remind myself what it is. Um, that was looking at knee replacement. They thought we should perhaps be doing more studies looking at knee replacement. But perhaps the best, well, the, the, well, the well known one is this rheumatoid arthritis study <coughs> where the researchers and the physicians thought fatigue was the main problem that patients suffered from, but when they, uh, was, it was pain, sorry, but when they asked the patients, it was fatigue. 
So again, it's making sure that we're actually looking at the right things and asking the right questions. And I think that is it. Enlightening and rather alarming talk. <laughs> I'm slightly depressed to realise that there's academic misconduct going on even in the Gregor Mendel's uh, monastery. Um, so uh, perhaps uh, Andre Tomlin has the answer. He's going to tell us now uh, why we need a national elf service. Thanks, Lawrence. I suspect it might depress you more, actually, but here we go. <laughs> Um, quick um, show of hands, how many researchers do we have in the room? Okay, and do we have any health professionals? Okay, and how many patients? Come on, we're all patients. <laughs> okay, um, so I think I hopefully have pitched this about right. Um, the first few slides are quite depressing, and then there's some good news towards the end, so please stick with me. <coughs> uh, most health research is irrelevant or unreliable, or both. Um, so what do I mean by that? I run a website called The Mental Health, uh, which helps mental health professionals keep up to date with the latest research. Uh, every day, Monday to Friday, we publish a blog uh, which summarises a new piece of evidence. It might be a, a paper in The Lancet, uh, it might be a, a, a new systematic review from the Cochrane Library, it might be a guideline from NICE. Um, and so I spend most of my days looking at mental health research. But I don't look at all of it, I just look at the really, really good stuff. So I've got this clever system of finding the great mental health research from about 500 different sources, from websites and databases and journals. And so every day I look through about 250 references. Um, and what I find is that about two or three of them are relevant to mental health practice in the UK and reliable, actually worth highlighting. So only 1% of the really good stuff is reliable and relevant. Um, this is a kind of classic study now, it's been published 10 years ago, a guy called John Leonidas from Stanford University who, who told us that most research findings are false. Um, it's actually more likely that research published in peer-reviewed journals and the impact journals, high-impact journals, uh, find uh, false findings rather than true findings. You may have heard a Radio 4 documentary about this a couple of weeks ago. Um, this message really hasn't yet gotten through to researchers, let alone the general public. Um, and building on what Chris said, I um, highly recommend the work of the James Lind Alliance, uh, a group who's been around in Oxford for about a decade now, who try and make research more relevant by working with patients uh, and health professionals and researchers to identify the questions that are important in their areas. Um, so what they do at the James Lind Alliance is take a subject, uh, so mental health, they've recently taken uh, dementia, schizophrenia, I think they're looking at depression at the moment. Um, and they ask what the important unanswered questions are from those different populations. Um, and then they do research on those questions. Um, so it's not just researchers doing research for other researchers to read. Uh, it's actually research that's inspired by the questions that are important to everyone. Uh, there's too much published evidence to keep up to date. This is an interesting blog that was written by a guy called Carl Hennigan. He's the director of the Centre for Evidence Based Medicine. Um, and he looked at the PubMed database, so the world's biggest biomedical database, indexes about 4,000 medical journals. Very US focused, but really important database. And he looked at how many randomized controlled trials were published year on year uh, from the date where Medline started in 1965. Um, so, randomized controlled trials, the gold standard uh, trial for looking at treatments. Um, and back in 1965, there were 39 randomized controlled trials published. Uh, by 1998, that number was 13,000, uh, and in 2008, it was 26,000. So in the last 10 years, between those two dates, it had doubled. Uh, and in fact, increase continues. By 2018, we'll have 50,000 randomized controlled trials published every year. So if you want to keep up to date with all that information, uh, as I'm sure many of you do, then you have to read, uh, I think, 71 randomized controlled trials a day in 2008, rather than one a day in 1965. Um, that's including weekends. 
know, so there's a huge amount of stuff out there, and the rubbish, unfortunately, obscures the good stuff. If you're somebody who's trying to find an answer to a question, trying to find some research that's relevant to your need, it's very difficult to find it. Uh, the Lancet have published a series of papers on this recently, all about research waste uh, that I very much recommend having a look at. It's also important to say that you know it's not all out there yet. Um, a lot of it is retracted. A lot of it doesn't get published in the first place. So the, the Glaxo example that Chris spoke about, they didn't publish those trials because the, the findings of those trials were not particularly uh, positive for their drugs or OXACT. Um, and the All Trials campaign, something many of you may have heard of, this is a, a, a campaign that's kind of gaining some momentum now to try and get all of the trials that have been conducted in the public domain. So when we do systematic reviews on them, we're actually looking at all of the data rather than just a subset. Uh, and this is a little bit of a side point, but whenever I have the opportunity to make it, I do. Um, re research funding isn't always uh, fairly allocated. In mental health, for example, um, Mental health problems account for about a quarter of all the ill health uh, in the UK, and yet mental health research gets 6% of the funding. So there isn't always a fair division of, of the money that's available. Um, I've got a, a personal collection of photographs of health professionals looking uh, confused and, and frightened when they're looking at health information. Um, this guy isn't actually a doctor, can you tell? Um, <laughs> But he's looking at the Cochrane Review on his iPad, um, and he's noticing that it's really hard to actually answer some questions. It's impenetrable, the text. It's got really complicated statistics in it. It's actually really poorly written. And so this is really hard for people. For health professionals, you would expect doctors to know how to read papers and critically appraise them and, and use the findings in practice. But they often don't. They often don't have those skills. Uh, the CASP program, the Critical Appraisal Skills program, is something that's been going for about 20 years now to try and teach these skills of critical appraisal, not just to, to health professionals, but to everyone. Uh, they work with teachers and with students. So it's trying to ensure, I guess, that research, as I said before, isn't just being published by researchers for other researchers. There's also lots of work going on internationally to try and increase or uh, improve the quality of research and the way it's reported. Uh, the Equator Network does this. It's a kind of website that has lots of different resources for making sure that trials are reported uh, in a consistent and useful way. So if you're reading a paper, you've actually got all the information that you need to make a decision on it. Uh, and there's lots of organisations who are trying to work right across you know, the whole of the, um, the general public and science and research to make sure that research is actually reported uh, in a reasonable way. But even if you can make sense of it, even if you find this kind of golden nugget of information that's a well-conducted trial that is relevant to your need, uh, it's actually quite tough to use it in practice. So, as I said before, professionals don't always have the skills to read and understand and implement research. And often clinical practice is very different from uh, the research setting. So it may be that the patient sitting before you is not the same as the patient in that, in that um, slightly different uh, world that is research. This is the most uh, sort of depressing slide, I think, is the fact that even when you do get that great research being published, being presented, it doesn't always actually get to the general public uh, the way that it should. These are headlines that Sense About Science has found over the last 10 years or so. Great examples of terrible headline writing. Um, often the research that they were writing about has nothing to do with the headline. Um, it didn't really reflect the story that had been written by a journalist. So the headline writer was just writing a headline that would get people to click on it, that would get them coming to their website, reading their newspaper. The evidence that's cited is often very poor quality. You know, it might not be scientific evidence at all. I think the evidence about mouthwash raising the risk of cancer is actually a survey. It's possibly not the sort of evidence that you would want to make a decision on about that particular fact. Um, and even when the research is good quality, it's often misreported. So here's a quick example. Um, exercise for depression. Quick show of hands. Who thinks exercise is a good thing to do if you're depressed? Okay, well over half. It sort of feels intuitively right, doesn't it? Get out in the sunshine, you know, if it's possible to get out of bed if you're clinically depressed, which obviously often it isn't. 
Uh, this trial was published two years ago in the BMJ, uh, internationally respected journal, looking at a specific type of exercise, facilitated physical activity. Uh, and what they asked was, does giving people who are currently depressed, who are being given usual treatment for depression, antidepressants, talking therapies, if you give them this extra facilitated physical activity, does it help with their depression? Do they get better? Do they take less antidepressants? Um, and it's a really well-conducted trial, um, randomised controlled trial, gold standard, nicely conducted, nicely reported in a good journal. Um, terrible press release came out of the university where the researchers worked, and that was picked up on by the newspapers. Their conclusion was quite disappointing. Um, facilitated physical activity didn't really help reduce depression or antidepressant use. Um, and obviously the person working in the marketing department, the PR department of the university thought, what might they say about that? So they said exercise doesn't really help with depression. They sort of simplified the message, they shortened it. But that was not what this trial was about. It was about a specific type of intervention that didn't work. And unsurprisingly, this is how the papers reported it. Uh, BBC News said exercise no help for depression, research suggests. Uh, the Daily Mail went with exercise does little to help the symptoms of depression, new study finds. And the Guardian said exercise doesn't help depression, study concludes. The Sun went with stunning advertising, <laughs> something special on that day in June. So it wasn't widely reported. <laughs> So this really kind of got my um, little elf ears twitching, um, and I wanted to kind of set the record straight. So I saw the paper a couple of days before, just like the journalists, and I reported it in a blog. Um, I wrote a very brief thousand word blog, just saying this is what the research said, um, this is how they conducted it, these are the results, this is what I think of it, um, and trying to set the record straight. Um, so I put that out on social media, um, lots of people saw it on Twitter, um, and I, I started conversations with the journalists who wrote the articles. So Bronwyn Jeffries from the BBC, for example, uh, he'd actually written a quite fair summary of the research. I said to her, why did this headline say exercise no help for depression? Uh, she said, well, because that was what the headline writer wrote. So the BBC changed their headline by lunchtime. She obviously went back and said to somebody, oh, hmm, I'm not sure, there's a bit of a discussion going on on Twitter, maybe we need to tweak that slightly. So they made it something a little bit closer to the actual. Not such a great headline, though. So I guess the upshot of all of this is what I'm saying is that health information needs to be relevant and reliable. It needs to be accessible at the point of need. Uh, it needs to be usable. Um, but most of all, it needs to be engaging. We need to help everyone engage with research. That's kind of what I... Uh, love to do, that exercise for depression example is a great one because I had conversations with researchers and health professionals and journalists and patients and carers on Twitter that day about that research. And a lot of those researchers were talking to patients about their depression research for the first time. Um, so we need to make, um, you know, wherever you are, whether you're kind of at the dinner table or in the allotment or at the bus stop or whatever it is, we need to get people talking about research making it part of our daily conversations. Um, that's what's inspired us to start this thing called the National Health Service. Um, that's our kind of um, shtick. And there are 11 elves in the woodland now. We've got elves in everything from dentistry to um, social care. Um, there's about 200 people in the team behind these elves. Um, and I guess the, the ethos that I've kind of outlined, they, they share that ethos. That's why people are working on this project. Um, but we're always on the lookout for new people. So if you're interested in contributing as a blogger to this, if you're interested in any of the subjects, or maybe you're thinking, you know, I love an elf in my area of interest, um, do come and have a, a word with me afterwards or, or contact me on Twitter or by email. So my kind of title of this talk was Science Bloggers of the World Unite. Um, uh, and, you know, there's, there's a lot of great science blogging that's going on out there. It's not just the National Health Service by any means. Um, there's so many problems with the quality of research and the way research gets reported by the media uh, and the way that um, publishing just happens uh, in the world. Um, but 
I'm really excited by um, science blogging, what's happened over the last five years or so, and the kind of explosion of blogs that we see, not just from researchers, but from patients, from health professionals, uh, from all sorts of different organisations. Um, they're written by a really wide range of people. Um, I had a pun about Joe and Joanna blogs, but I can't quite work it in. But there we go. Um, so, yeah, that's my message really, I suppose. Let's give everyone the opportunity to engage with research in an accessible way. Um, and for me, doing that in a blog and doing it on Twitter uh, is the way that works best. Okay, thanks very much. Positive uh, developments there as well. Um, seizing, seizing the information for ourselves. I'm not sure the world is ready for psycholinguistic help yet, so I'll have to take that. So now we're going to open it up to um, the audience. So, would you like to raise your hand if you have any questions or comments uh, for Chris and Andre? Thank you very much for the very interesting presentation. I have a question to Andrew. Um, I was wondering, um, don't we, when I was working on a kind of similar project with Health Information Germany in for the Health Reform Health Online in ICFIC, um, we had a policy about um, that we don't make decisions for the patients, so we give them the options, but try to be kind of a decision. But it caused a lot of um, the problems that some participants didn't like it because they didn't want to have an answer and say, you know, you're being very vague. This is good, but this is also good. So I'm wondering how you deal with this issue about um, not giving too much direction in people's in a certain direction based on the evidence, being kind of uh, balanced, but at the same time, and uh, not getting in, get them frustrated by being too vague about the results, especially when evidence is very slim. Yeah, it's, it's, that's a really hard thing to do. Our websites aren't aimed at the general public. Uh, they're aimed at health professionals. And so in some ways we sort of um, say that's not really our responsibility. Um, although 20% of people that use mental health consider themselves patients and carers, so it does get used a lot by that population. I think it's complicated. And you have to kind of communicate the complexity of research. Um, so the Siroxat example that Chris made there's a paper published in the BMJ a couple of months ago about Siroxat, and it shows that, um, well, it kind of alludes to a possible link between the black box warning that went out about Siroxat um, in the US that prevented a lot of people from taking antidepressants, or that made people stop taking antidepressants. Um, that there's, a, there's a, an association between that and increased suicide in young people. People who were taking antidepressants who stopped because of the Siroxat warning. That's that, and you know, that research is, is decent research, but it's certainly not conclusive research. So you know, how can you give a, a bottom line to that research to somebody who says, I've got a teenager and I'm thinking about whether they should take antidepressants or not? It's really complicated. I think we say, engage people in the debate, show them the research, summarize it, present it to them in a way that they can understand, and then let them make those decisions for themselves. But yeah, I don't think that's a question that's gonna get answered quickly. Rather than just, sorry. I think the key that you're saying is engagement rather than just disseminating. Because some people are very passive, they disseminate it, they don't get engaged in the discussion. Yeah, yeah completely. Yeah. You know, for me, that's what evidence based healthcare is all about. It's, it's saying to you know, the patient, this is, you know, you're the most important person in this whole discussion. Um, and it's not that kind of traditional um, view that, that Lawrence was saying very early on. Um, about the doctor making your decisions for you. You know, he's this respected person. Um, you're very much involved in that process. Uh, not to, um, the only thing I'd like to ask is, everybody here seems to have done something on your research. Has anybody here actually been a trial participant themselves? <laughs> Just a few of us. So, I mean, that, that's an important thing. It is useful if you actually do volunteer yourselves for trials and, and see it from the other side. I've done loads. <laughs> Simply because when I was at college, I discovered you got paid for doing them. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, these are the phase one studies where it's first into man type studies. Um, so they're normally drug studies. 
And uh, I, I think in, in, when I was at university, we used to get about 500 pounds for drug study. So uh, I funded my alcohol addiction through university. <laughs> There was um, a study a few, a very alarming study a few years ago. I remember this drugs trial where there were several people died and were seriously um, injured, like permanently injured. Um, did that? I mean, that was so widely publicised. I'm wondering if that had an impact on subsequent um, volunteering. It did. Yeah. There was an increase. Mm -hmm. and, and the reason why there was an increase is simply because people, lots of people, the general public, don't realise that you can actually get paid for doing <laughs> early phase drug work. So these are studies done on healthy volunteers, I have to say. So the, the, you volunteer, you're a healthy volunteer, the, the ultimate aim is you, you leave healthy. Um, it is very rare for people to actually get injured on these early phase studies because they're done on very small numbers and we start off with extremely low doses. In that particular study, they actually didn't break any rules or regulations. It was just that it was a new type of drug that uh, nobody had had much experience with that led to the problems. I used to actually work in a unit that did some phase one type work with these what we call biologics. These are monoclonal antibodies. And we thought that uh, when we heard about this study, we thought, well, we would have made that mistake because we, we routinely used to get healthy volunteers in, take their blood, and then mix it with the monoclonal antibody to see if we got excess cytokine release and things like that. But in this particular case, I understand that even if we'd have done that, it wouldn't have shown up. And uh, the normal way that we dose healthy volunteers is in 10 minute intervals. So for normal drugs, that's fine because if they have an anaphylactic type reaction, we can stop the study. And we dose in intervals because if we dosed everybody, we couldn't look after six seriously ill patients. And that's what happened at Northwick Park was the actual side effect didn't show up until an hour later. And so they'd already dosed everybody and they didn't have enough ITU space. So we, that's what made that whole thing even more serious. I guess the Ebola vaccine is a really good example of that recently, the, the work last week. Um, and that, I don't know if we saw that news story, the nurse in Oxford had been the first person to have the Ebola vaccine. Um, and that kind of trial, which has got such an obvious link to being an incredibly important person for humanity, you know, saving the lives potentially of thousands of people. That's been involved in that sort of process. That's an obvious one, but I guess most research has got that element to it as well. Yeah. I think we've got a question down in front and then back. Um, it seems to me that you're both sending out a call almost for greater engagement in, um, pub in research as a means of, um, yeah, testing it really. That engagement requires a great deal of prior knowledge on the participants and uh, many people who aren't medical practitioners are, they haven't got the time for that. They, they want to rely on a, on a mix of folk psychology and um, some sort of deference to authority. I was wondering how you feel you can engage with that issue. Yeah, I mean that is hard. We we're starting to run various <coughs> focus groups patients in to speak to them about, uh, about them. I mean, one of the biggest reasons we know why people don't take part in clinical trials up at Dereford is really simple. It's not that they're worried about being guinea pigs or anything. It's a more obvious problem than that. It's car parking. <laughs> they can't, you know, they, they, they don't want to waste time and money trying to park up at Dereford. And that's the biggest thing that stops people volunteering for our trial. And so time is a big issue. Um, Again, it's about trying to you know, infuse people about uh, when they do come to hospital, the, the work, when they come in to see the, the physician, and they say, is there perhaps a trial I could take part in? And so you know, they, they ask the question rather than the physician who's you know, maybe struggling with, with workload to try and remember all of the trials that we have running at any one time. So it's, it's about trying to make sure that people realize that, uh, in, particularly in Derriford, that we do do research um, and it, hopefully Ultimately, it's there for their benefit. But, uh, it, is a, it is an uphill struggle. And we do have, for uh, certain studies, we have trial steering committees which have independent members who look at oversee the study. And we normally invite a patient from that particular group to sit on that committee. They don't take part in the study other than you know, offer help to us. So one of the things that uh, when we design protocols is you know, we're thinking, how many visits are those patients going to make to the hospital? 
And that's where it's really important to have patients give input into the design of the study, because they can say, I'm not going to do 10 visits, I might do two, and then you can think about, oh, how am I going to redesign that study in order to capture the information we want, but still get the volunteers that we need. So, again, it's very important that we try and infuse people and try and take them with us. It is a bit of an uphill struggle, though, unfortunately. Yeah, I think folk tradition and deference to authority, that's a great phrase. I think, yeah, absolutely, I think that does exist. <coughs> um, but I think, for me, in terms of engaging with research, reading research, discussing research. It's a question of actually giving people the opportunity to making it accessible and usable so they can. Um, I was up down the pub last Friday and um, I was trying to get involved in a discussion. This probably says more about my friends and family than it does about anything else, but they were talking about cannabis. Uh, and I published a blog last week about cannabis. Um, an interesting study, cannabis use in young people um, and the risks of further thing, things happening later in life. And unsurprisingly, it found that if you smoke a lot when you're less than 17, you're less likely to go to university or finish school. Um, it also suggested you're more likely to try and kill yourself, um, which was widely reported, um, which wasn't a particularly um, strong finding of the research, but that was very widely reported, more so than not finishing school, surprisingly enough. Um, but, Everyone was really engaged for 90 minutes in that conversation. Um, and it was about a particular study that had just been published. Um, because I was there to say, look, there's this piece of research. Um, so I think people are genuinely interested in it. It's about finding something that interests people and introducing them to good quality research on that topic. Um, thanks for a great talk. It's, uh, it's great to hear my own pop conversation back to me, <laughs> only with references, so that's really good. Um, thank you. Um, my, uh, my question is, and there's a bit of context, but maybe I'll just save you that. My question is, who pays for mental health? This doesn't look like a ragtag bunch of, uh, you know, late night keyboard warriors setting the world to rights. I mean, is there, is there any money behind it? Uh, it's owned by my company, so I have a company which spun out from Oxford University 12 years ago. Um, it's run at the moment as a, um, a project with 200 people who want to do it because that's what they're interested in. So we've all worked in evidence-based healthcare for a long time, um, and we're all interested in improving the quality of health information. Um, it's something that we have to generate revenue from some, at some point in order to continue with it, because I have to start paying those people. Some of them are working one day a week now on their elves. Uh, and they are doing it in evenings and weekends, so it's great that you say it doesn't look like a ragtag evenings and weekend project, because that's exactly what it is at the moment. Um, Can I uh, contradict myself flat and say, someone who lives in the actual world of academia, I am I'm increasingly, and have been you know, for 10 years or more, impressed that the level of scholarship that goes on in the blogosphere basically knocks the spots off what goes on professionally, not least because what goes on professionally is invariably tarnished by one, well, is often tarnished by one particular problem or another, and you only get to read a tiny fraction of it. So uh, I'm, I'm constantly impressed by what goes on there in the global sphere about things I know about and things I don't. So I didn't want to say so break take much, yes, but Paul Scholars, no. Oh, no, no, I take that as a compliment, don't worry. But it, I think it's, what's interesting about what we do is that it's, um, it's I think it's, accessible in a way which a lot of science blogs aren't. So, you know, if you follow the mental health on Twitter, um, or if you, if you go to a talk like this, um, it's, it's easily, you know, um, easy to remember, um, and it's kind of got a sort of fun feel to it. And then you get into the detail of the information, and it's actually about suicide and drug use, and, you know, so there's some darkness there as well. But um, that's what's interesting for us, is, is presenting it in a way which is using the tricks of, kind of charities, I suppose, health charities have been doing this for years, but universities and public sector organisations producing really good quality content haven't, um, and that's what we're trying to do. Thank you. Well, the, the really useful thing about the, the blogosphere is actually being able to make some sense of the huge amount of publications that are out there. So, you know, none of us have enough time to actually read through all of this, so it's great that somebody can actually sift it for us beforehand and then we can actually have a look at the papers that really count uh, and then make our decisions based on that. 
Thank you very much. So, uh, yes, I don't know much about uh, the value of blogging because I haven't <coughs> read too many blogs about science or, in fact, any other area. So I'm not as enthusiastic as the person behind me. Um, and I wonder, actually, about the value of this blog, in, in particularly with regard to your company, if I understood it correctly. So as a physician now, instead of going and reading the original article, which I might or might not, not understand, I'm actually reading your work. And I'm not sure if it's any better, whether your ability to convey that message is any better than the ability of those other uh, reporters to give the information. So in a certain way, I have to trust you that what you tell me about those 1,000 papers is, or whatever it is, now, not only that, now, in fact, I have to sift through not only hundreds of or thousands of papers, I have to sift through, I don't know, millions of blogs? So I have the double jeopardy of understanding which is a good paper and understanding which is a good blog. So as a physician, I'm not a physician, but supposedly I am a physician. What am I to do now? Read your blog or go read the original article, which obviously contain far more information in details that might or might not import, be important for, uh, for for their decision. Yeah, my, my aim is to try and get people to read the thing that I'm blogging about. Um, so the blogs that I write and the 80 people who write for the mental health, um, range of different people from you know, professors at one end to PhD students at the other, lots of different people write for the site. Um, that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to get somebody to click on that link at the bottom uh, that contains a 10-page paper in the BMJ, or a 250-page Cochrane Review, or a 400-page NICE guideline, and read it, and think about using it in practice. That's our objective. Um, and I'm sure there are lots of people who bypass what we do, who aren't interested in reading the blog, who aren't bothered about a summary and a clinical commentary, um, who maybe aren't bothered about the critical appraisal that the person who blogs gives that blog, so highlighting the strengths and weaknesses of the study. Some people just go straight to the BMJ paper or the Cochrane Review. My experience of working with health professionals for the last 20 years is that most of them don't. Most of them, you know, maybe have a subscription to a journal in their particular field of interest that they read on a weekly basis, but they don't spend their time uh, looking for information and, and, and um, filtering it out and synthesising it. They need somebody to do it for them. So that's essentially what we're doing. We're providing an information science service that says, today, we think this is the most important study, it's relevant and it's reliable. Um, but I totally get your point, not everyone's going to want that service. Oh. Chris, would you like to Okay, um, so we have, I think we have time for just one more question. Um, so we're in the middle there. This is a very small question. Um, what uh, journals do you recommend for mental health? What, which are the best ones? In the ones that we write about most often um, are uh, JAMA, JAMA Psychiatry, the DMJ, the Lancet, British Journal of Psychiatry, um, and then about sort of 30 others. There's a list on the website. Yeah. We, we look at 150 journals. Um, JAMA being? Sorry, the, the Journal of the American Medical Association. Yeah. Um, so, and increasingly, what those big Journals are doing JAMA, um, Lancet, BMJ is creating kind of um, sort of subsections of their site and journals that spin off from that because they're all online these days. So Lancet has a Lancet Psychiatry Journal, JAMA has a JAMA Psychiatry Journal. Um, yeah, that's an ongoing kind of piece of information science work that we do to try and think about what those top 10 or 20 sources are. Do you have any bedtime reading you can recommend, Chris? Yeah, the only thing I, I would say is that uh, obviously quite a lot of research is never published. <coughs> More and more, there is a requirement that, uh, for interventional research at least, is, is that it's published on um, public access databases. And so, obviously, if you are thinking of doing a research project, don't just search the medical literature. Do go and look at those public access database websites uh, and look for studies that you know are, are up there but have never been published. So, for example, clintrials.gov is the kind of biggest website in the world that the public access database for clinical trials. And I can tell you, research, when they look, researchers look, um, over a third of the papers, uh, that are, uh, or a third of the studies on that site haven't been published five years later. 
So that's the world's biggest public access database. So, so you can see the number of studies that don't actually get reported for one reason or another, normally because of negative results. Sorry, can you repeat that website? Oh, it, well, it's called <coughs> clinicaltrials.gov. Thank you. I think, I think we'll have to wrap up there, so we can maybe have a, a chat later on. So. Thank you very much um, to uh, Chris Rollinson and Andrew Tomlin for what I, I personally found an extremely enlightening cog talk. Uh, it's fascinating to hear about their work, um, which is clearly sort of pushing at the frontiers in some ways of how to address this, this problem of um, information overload, the huge amount of data that's out there. And clearly this is work that has the um, impact, have a, an effect on, on all, all of our lives. So it's, uh, it's great to hear about what they're doing. In some ways, I, mean, I'm, I was reminded, I heard last week of a study um, that the public are uh, uh, invited to participate in spotting penguins in the Antarctic. So the researchers themselves can't, don't have the time to look for all these penguins. So you can go online and look at all these photos and just say, is there a penguin in the photo? And in some ways, it's a bit like that. It's like we're all out there looking for penguins. Um, so long may, long may that um, continue. So um, thank you very much for um, coming to this COG talk. I'd like to thank uh, once again Chris Robinson and Andre Tomlin uh, for giving their time and putting so much work into those presentations. I'd like to thank Lucy Davis for organising the COG talk. And do we, do we have a date for the next COG talk? Oh, uh, yes. The next one is the um, 23rd of October and it's going to be on... Uh, storytelling in um, non-traditional media. So we've got someone coming from the world of games, a psychologist, hopefully uh, an artist who writes digital stories online. And there will also be a virtual game to play as well beforehand. So I expect you all to be here with your smartphones. Okay. Thank you very much, Lucy. We should look forward to that. Thank you very much for coming. Thanks for your participation. And we look forward to seeing you next time.